sticking around after such a scary movie. Uh, <laughs> horror movie is here at the Independent Picture. So now we have about 45 minutes, I think, to talk about it. So we'd like to hear your questions and comments, but first, We've got this. We've got this terrific panel of local clergy. So let me introduce them. Then I'm going to pose a few questions, and then we'll turn to you. Reverend Dr. Val Re Rosenquist is the senior pastor of First United Methodist Church in Uptown, Downtown Charlotte. She says her church's goals are to practice inclusion, pursue justice, and promote the arts why she's here today. Um, next, Reverend Dr. Rodney Sadler Jr. is the Associate Professor of Bible and the Director of the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation at Union Presbyterian Seminary. He also works in the areas of, in Charlotte, uh, in the areas of anti-racism and social justice across the city, the state, and beyond. And the Reverend John Cleghorn is the head of the staff at Caldwell Presbyterian Church in Charlotte. He's also the author of the upcoming book, Building Belonging, The Church's Call to Create Community and House Our Neighbors, out in October. So John's a Presbyterian, Val's a Methodist, and Rodney is all forms of Baptist except Southern Baptist. <laughs> Which reminds me of a joke. <laughs> a Presbyterian, a Methodist, and a Baptist walk into a movie theater. And, <laughs> and I'm Tim Funk, a former religion reporter for the Charlotte Observer. And I'm Catholic in case we need any Hail Mary passes during the discussion. <laughs> Let me start by asking our panel this question. I noticed that the poster for this film we just watched has <coughs> resurrected, in a word, um, the question, thanks, WWJD, that we used to see on bracelets and buttons and posters a decade or so ago. So based on your years of studying, preaching, and preaching and teaching the good book, what do you think Jesus would say or do? about or to these Christian nationalists who are invoking his name and using his image to further their cause. I noticed they even put a mega hat on him uh, in one of their protests, on one of their posters. Who wants to start? <laughs> I'll start and then let you guys carry it away, which you will, which will be so wonderful. But this is, like this mutual admiration society that we have here. It's a great panel to be together. Um, I just have so much admiration for these two. Um, what would Jesus do with this? Jesus preached such a, a gospel of nonviolence and uh, a message that was opposed to the powers that be. He looked to people to um, serve and love, and the least of these were his priority. Um, it wasn't to be using the powers that were available. In fact, we know that he spurned those powers, that his whole, as we go through this Lenten period, we, we see that he totally turned, tried to teach his disciples to not be relying on those kinds of powers. Uh, and then we have this movement that is the antithesis uh, and has, has garnered for itself such a different message. And I firmly believe that these folks firmly believe it, um, that, that Jesus was somebody other than who we have presented in the Gospels and that the message of Jesus is nothing like what we have presented in Jesus' own actions. Uh, hello, everybody. How are you all doing? <laughs> so uh, I wonder what Jesus would think, and I think it's dangerous to probably speculate too much on what Jesus would think as he's 
not here, but we are. A few things I would say, though, is that we need to remember the context in which Jesus lived. Jesus was a first century Palestinian Jewish man uh, who came from very, very, uh, very, very limited means. Uh, he was a troglodyte. He lived in a cave. He was a, uh, a person who led a movement that did not go to the big cities. You don't hear about Jesus uh, and his movement towards Sepphoris or Tiberias in Galilee. But he went to all the small towns, the small villages, to mobilize people. He basically led a movement. I, I look at Barber and what Barber does with the marches. And, and Jesus did something similar. I'm not comparing them. But Jesus was leading people who were cast out. Galilee was not the center of the uh, Greco-Roman Empire, not the center of the Jewish Empire. It was the outpost where the least and the lost and the left out would go. So Jesus, were he here, would probably be lifting up the interest of, well, we've mentioned Matthew 25 so far, uh, I was hungry, you fed me, I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, I was a stranger, you welcomed me, naked, you clothed me, uh, sick and you cared for me, in prison and you uh, took care of me. Jesus would probably be concerned about those issues. Now, one thing I will say, uh, in terms of this being a political movement, Christian nationalism political movement, Jesus was inevitably political. Yeah. Marcus Borg makes it very clear that uh, at any point in time we consider Jesus, not to consider the politics of Jesus, uh, so does Aubrey Hendricks, not to consider the political dimensions would be a great mistake. But I think that he would have great trouble with this, in as much as the fruit of this movement is not love, is not uh, generosity, goodness, welcome, uh, embrace, but an alienization of others, a return to self, sort of a narcissistic self-focus. This seems completely antithetical to anything for which Jesus would stand. Amen. Uh, he taught me everything I know, so if I, you disagree with anything I say, uh, I'm a student of his. Um, you know, uh, you, Tim, I think you asked, what would Jesus do? I, the, the human side of the God-man, you know, had different reactions on different days. I mean, some days he wept, uh, some days he turned the tables over in the temple. Uh, he would probably remind us all to not assume that God is on our side either. In other words, not to claim everybody else is wrong and, you know, this side is right and that side is, is, is wrong. Um, but, you know, what he said explicitly uh, was render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. In other words, these two worlds are not to be combined into one which is what this movie was sort of making the case for, that there is this 100% overlay of politics and faith. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I try to go back to, you know, when, when, when everything gets confusing in the world, and, and particularly about faith, you know, think about Jesus as the bullseye of the target. What you know, and that's what he said. That's what he said. So I would go to that. So North Carolina is sort of ground zero for a lot of what you saw here. We have Mark Robinson running for governor. Um, one of your fellow pastors, uh, Mark Harris, was just uh, nominated. Uh, probably going to go to Congress. Um, the Salt and Light Conference you saw, uh, where Ralph Reed speaking at, happens in Charlotte. But there you also have Bishop um, Barber on the other side, and I suspect all of your churches would be more on that side. So I'm wondering, what have you seen in your, your in your, your congregation's everyday life like this? Do you feel threatened? Do you feel like you want to go out and fight? What, what, what sort of, what are you seeing every day? Uh, this is a movie, You're, you live in the real life. What do you, what do you see and hear, anything? <laughs> I guess I'll start off. Uh, the first thing, okay. Just speak into the microphone. Is it, is it green? 
it's it's got it's red. Okay. red. Thank you. Uh, so the first thing I'd say is um, what appears to me to be the most significant concern would be to help us understand who Jesus really was. And I think that what this movement suggests to me is that we all seem to love Jesus, kind of. It's like a the vagary, the vague understanding of who Jesus is. And Jesus has been allowed to be morphed into something of our own making, of our own choosing. Can I tell two quick stories? So one of them has to do with the, uh, this notion of the image of Jesus. Uh, there's a picture long ago that we all know called the, uh, the Head of Christ uh, by Warner Salmon. Uh, and it's actually taken from a, a painting by uh, Leon Lermite, uh, which is found in, I think, the Louvre in, 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 uh, in France. Uh, if you look at the picture, you can see that it and the Head of Christ are the exact same thing. Uh, in the, the head of Christ, there's this glow around Jesus. This very, and we say it's the halo that Jesus has. If you look at the actual picture, uh, the actual picture has Jesus sitting in front of a window as the sun is setting. So the light is coming in from the back. It's not a halo. It's the light of the setting sun. In essence, when you decontextualize Jesus, the details of his life no longer make sense. And I think that this is a movement that has taken a decontextualized Jesus and tried to utilize him for our own purpose. The second story uh, is this simply, uh, there was an, an attempt to make an image of Jesus that would be authentic. Um, a, uh, Richard Neve, who is a forensic anthropologist from England, made this incredible uh, three-dimensional representation of Jesus. People didn't like it. They said it didn't look uh, very lifelike. So one of the things that they did was they had this gentleman, go uh, Donato, uh, paint a picture of it that would be more approachable and more whatever. So Donato goes out, takes the image of Jesus, paints this beautiful picture of it, and sets it up. And guess what people said when they saw it? The picture that he painted looked just like him. <laughs> we often try to make Jesus over in our own image instead of trying to conform to Jesus in his image. So I think that this is a problem that we see uh, not just with the Christian nationalist movement, but this is a problem that we see in ourselves. And I'd love us to find a way to get to who was Jesus, what was he talking about, and how are we, uh, how do we Instead of getting Jesus to follow us, how do we follow him? Amen. Um, so, Tim, your question was, what, what, you know, what's happening in our churches? Yeah, or, or outside our churches. Or outside our churches. Probably happens at Val's Church as well. well. One of the things that happens outside Caldwell Presbyterian, we're over in the Elizabeth neighborhood, is that three, four times a year, uh, for many, many years, uh, we're protesting. Um, this group comes down. Uh, they have a website. It's it's tragic. Uh, there's always some 12 or 13 year old child filming it, and then adults are there giving us hell. Um, and our church has gotten so used to this that uh, we know not to engage with them. Sometimes we surround them with and, and sing hymns, so we kind of out love them. Um, so that you know on any given Sunday that that might happen it might happen tomorrow um, uh, I think that uh, they would see that we're turning a 14,000 square foot education building into uh, apartments for the chronically homeless um, I think that they would see that we're engaging difficult topics and sometimes stepping on each other's toes uh, and sometimes maybe even doing more than that, hurting each other a little bit as we try to seek for the truth. Um, I have tried to think about how to preach about this, and uh, I know that you know there there has to be some something short of an, a complete overlay of politics and faith at the same time I confess to have been 
you know, I, I preach sermons that speak to this issue and speak to the former president because I think there is a singular threat right now that, that transcends history. This is not any other time span. That may not be a very humble thing to say. But, um, you know, so we're struggling and we're working at it and we're trying to remain uh, humble and um, we're in, inviting other voices into, uh, into the conversation. Val? I'll just go to uh, the recent history of the United Methodist Church, which probably many of you have uh, watched unfold, and that is the disaffiliation of many of our more conservative churches that uh, ostensibly over the issue of LGBTQ rights and what most of us believe is also more over um, who has power and trying to grab and attach power and um, be able to wield power in a larger context. So what I've seen and was mentioning before um, is that some of the same tactics are being used by this group, and, and that is uh, an ability to look away from what is true and in fact to fabricate, to actually outright lie, and then put forth as truth the lies, and to act within that and be morally justified because of the lies that they have created. And th that film, you know, that was in spades, that's... Um, so, so Val, a couple of years ago you married a same-sex couple and, and got into a little hot water with your bishop. Uh, did you see any, I mean, what kind of reaction did you get from people that maybe didn't think you should have done? Is it, did, um, I mean, did you ever feel unsafe? I mean, has it gotten to that point anymore? Um, not anymore, no. Uh, in my own church, our church was mostly um, very much in support um, in my own congregation. Certainly in the denomination, uh, there was a lot of um, the same kind of, same churches, the same clergy and their churches who disaffiliated were the ones that uh, came to attack, basically, in whatever ways that they could. I'm gonna ask one more question, and then we're gonna open it up to you all for questions or comments. Brad, I think, is wants you to actually come down, right? Then where he's gonna be with the microphone so we can actually Alter hear you call. and they're taping it too. Alter call. <laughs> Alter call, exactly. Here's my question. So let me play devil's advocate, if you'll excuse the phrase, uh, and ask this. Um, the movie made the case that the Christian right uses fear tactics to get its folks riled up, boiling angry, ready to fight. Well, this movie was pretty scary and sometimes painted with a broad brush. Um, I know you, a lot of people told me out, out there they're pretty pissed off after seeing this. Um, is fighting fire with fire uh, the only way to answer Christian nationalism? Um, you know, what happened to the exalted idea that the church should be a countercultural alternative to the broader society's addiction to power and privilege and confrontation? I mean, what, what's your, how do you answer this? Do you answer it with more of the same on your side or do you do it differently? And you kind of addressed that a little bit, uh, but all of you did. But if you could answer that a little more. So let me start off by saying, um, no, I don't think we fight fire with fire. I, I work a lot in environmental justice and climate justice issues too. And I've often said this about the climate movement. Uh, people hear all the time, well, the climate is heating up. Uh, we've got two degrees centigrade that hotter before the planet is up. And people have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, it's a fear-based argument, and it does not lead us in any positive direction. I was like, what if we instead give a vision of what can be? And this seems to me to be uh, pretty much along the lines of what Jesus was doing. Jesus promised the kingdom of God an opportunity for everyone to have their needs met, everyone to be uh, engaged in relationship with each other, everyone to have access to love. Why don't we lead, uh, if we're going to oppose this kind of movement, why don't we do it from a positive space? This is what Christianity could be. 
This is what Jesus does say that lifts up love and welcomes all and uh, provides a way forward for us. So I would love to see us respond in a way that says, uh, just like uh, your great example there, I'm going to reach out with love to you all. We're going to come out and share with you. Maybe give them some lemonade and cookies when you come out to protest. Uh, but let's try to do, to show the alternative. Let's try to model what it is that Jesus would do. Uh, and I think that there is uh, perhaps greater potential for success in ex uh, accepting a new model than in trying to replicate uh, the failed politics of those who would be Christian nationalists. I would just say, in addition to that, um, I don't think it has done us much good to not know yes. what, what was presented here. And much of this, as they say, is under the radar. Um, so I really appreciate things like this, um, media that covers areas that others usually don't, and that I personally have not seen a lot of this footage. A lot I did, but there's new information here, and it is scary information, and I don't think it does us any good to not be aware of um, the extent to which people are going in our country to, um, to change uh, towards the right, and um, that being said, yes, if we could, as Christian people, do Christian type things mm -hmm. and show that as the model and you know, do the housing and do the homelessness and um, support everybody in gender equality and uh, yes, of course. The question is how do we do that in such a way that doesn't um, lose so many yeah. over the next years? Uh, agreed. Um, you know, I, I think uh, someone once said when they go low, we go high. And so, I mean, we have to double down on love over hate and over inclusivity, over exclusivity, and over a mindset of abundance uh, versus a mindset of scarcity, a mindset of hope versus a mindset of fear. And all that's in what Jesus said. All we have to do is just read his words. And, you know, whether it's the Sermon on the Mount or any of the parables, uh, Jesus took power and turned it on its head. And um, I, it was counterculture, as, as you said. And uh, we have to ascribe visibly to those things. And Val's Church is doing amazing things. Um, the, uh, you know, to bear witness. I'm, I'm, I love that phrase. We have to bear witness, not in any sort of a bold, braggadocio way, but we have to bear witness to the gospel as we understand it, steadily, quietly, humbly, visibly. Can, can I say one thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, one thing I'll say, too, because uh, uh, I, what I said sounded very vague and you know, so how do we do that, Rodney? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, there's a new unsettling force for liberation. I love those signs that we saw from Dr. Barber at the end, uh, the, the, the introductory piece and then the concluding piece. But one of the things you saw there was the Moral Monday movement. Kate, is that you right there? Yes. Can you raise your hand, please? Uh, Kate Damali can tell you, if you're interested in getting involved in the Poor People's Campaign, uh, a national call for moral revival, interested in finding an alternative way of representing the values that you may hold as part of a, your Christian faith, your Christian traditions, or your human traditions, your human faith. I want to ask that you think about getting involved in this. I think this gives us a way forward that can challenge what's going on with Christian nationalism and recenter a different ideal of what Christ was like. And one area you could follow their lead is getting people out to vote. I think they are more successful than the other side. I saw this great cartoon. It was uh, probably in New Yorker, but it had these women uh, sitting on a bench, and they all were wearing, it, wearing the handmade, handmade, you know, the... Yeah, and one of them was saying, 
I, I, I'm sorry I stayed home. I thought oh, Biden was too old. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, come down and, and give, you, give us your opinion or ask a question. I, I mean, Brad would prefer you coming down if you can, because it's easier I can for filming you too. Way. Uh, Steve Adams, I just want to thank the theater and, and all of you for a uh, hold to your, got to hold, hold it right close to you. Oh, okay, that's better. Um, I'm a, a lapsed Southern Baptist originally and then now a lapsed uh, Episcopalian. So uh, anyway, um, what I wanted to, I wanted to make a comment and then see what you guys thought in terms of feedback was uh, when you're talking <coughs> about at a macro level, creating the fear is very motivational. Um, <coughs> And when, you know, if you're talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, what everybody wants to uh, have happen is to be heard. And what I saw on a lot of the shots of the people who were very agitated is a lot of insecurity. So on to what you guys are saying from a personal level, if you can listen and then discuss things in common uh, and be prepared to do that. But at a macro level, we do need some type of recognition as far as when it grades over into, you know, threats of security and domestic terrorism and stuff. Like, I, I was curious as to what, uh, what were the people protesting at your, at your church? Yes, I want to know. Uh, primarily that we're gay friendly. Oh, I see. They, they would disagree with a variety of things, but that's what, that's their main thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, I remember there, years ago there was on CNN, there was a, a gentleman, I don't know, but it's a congregation somewhere near here, he advocated putting gay people behind barbed wire. I don't know if you remember that. And the thing that struck me and gave me chills was the reaction of his congregation when he said that. Nobody stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, what, what the hell is going on here? Anyway, I'm kind of rambling on. I, I think I hear you making a point that's very important, and that is we can't just say, well, this is a bunch of deplorables. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That we have to sit down and try and meet these people where they are and say what we believe and listen to what they believe uh, and then work from there. And I, I yeah. was concerned about that a couple of weeks ago. You know, I think Jesus met people where they were and right. he listened to them and then he said, well, here's what I think. And if we could get back to at least that much, we might uh, be able to be a slightly less divided. It's not that yeah. simple, I know. Meet them, meet them with the heart uh, on a personal level and try to help them overcome some of their insecurities, whatever they might be. I mean, it could be economic, could be familial. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Uh, a few months ago, you were asked what could be done and all that. Why weren't you doing that all along? I'm not sure I understand. What, why aren't we doing? What aren't we doing? Why weren't you doing the opposite of what was happening? That's why. That's why wasn't question. that your message Good. all along? Good. That's a positive message. So, it should have been there. Amen. So uh, let me just say that since 2013, I have been an active member of the Moral Monday Movement. I've been an active member of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral, uh, for moral re revival. I've been an active part of the Reimagining America Project, uh, which Jennifer Roberts and I started since 2020. Uh, we have been doing it. We are bearing witness. We are trying to make sure that we pe people see a different way of faith. And we are not alone. There's so many people out there that are actively trying to present a different vision. People like Shane Claiborne, who you saw in this movie. People like Jamar Tisby, who was just featured at Covenant Presbyterian Church. Uh, there are a lot of people that are trying to present that different message. And we'd love to, to have uh, people out there. One of the things I think that we need in this point in time is to find a way to engage across ideological difference. And unfortunately, what we end up with is these echo chambers where people that think like us, well, we get together all the time, don't we? <laughs> and then people who think like, quote unquote, them, I don't like us as them, they get together all the time. 
and then we are in our echo chambers. We need to begin to engage each other, to reach out to each other, and find ways to have conversations. So I, I, I'll try to sit down and talk to, what's your friend's name uh, that, that leads the anti-abortion movement? Ch uh, Flip? Uh, I'll try to talk to Flip from time to time. I don't know how well it goes. But how do we begin to foster a sense of relationship that might make us able to hear each other, might make us able to understand uh, the fears, the frustrations, the anxieties that those who have antithetical ideas come from. And then find if there's some common ground. Is there some common space where we stand together? Well, we all believe that God's children should all be. We all believe that every human being, uh, life should be respected and their dignity should be protected. Let's build on that. Let's find those common grounds. John? Well, I, I, I don't want to jump in front of Val, but I hear you saying something that we have to acknowledge. Yeah, yeah. And that is for decades. You know, I don't think about the church as a monolith, mm -hmm. and, and this movement is very disturbing. But for decades, the church was complacent and was silent. And, and a big wing of the church was homophobic. And, you know, you, on and on and on. Um, and the church somehow writ large has to find a way to confess that and say it out loud um, and uh, meet people where they are. Our, our, our pews are largely full of people who have been hurt by church or disillusioned by church. And we have to say that out loud. We have to confess. And so I don't know if that's part of what you were getting at, but that catharsis of saying, when we were at the center of American life, when Christianity was in its peak, in its paradigm, we got fat and happy and assumed that the whole nation was on our side. We're on the margins now and getting more, more and more marginalized. I do think, I'm curious about this movement, I feel like, just, you know, for what it is, it's like a snake <coughs> eating its own tail because there are fewer and fewer and fewer people who identify themselves as Christians anymore because of this and because of past sins. So I don't know where this goes with this wing of Christianity. And then the rest of us have to do what we think is right, including saying, yeah, we didn't always get it right. And in fact, we caused harm. Amen. You want to got a question or comment? Just a few things. Uh, first of all, I'm the granddaughter of an ordained Episcopalian minister. I'm the daughter of a mother who spent two years in Heidelberg, Germany during the Nazi regime. Uh, I am a Jew by choice for the last 50 years. And I, I see this movie in juxtaposition having just seen the St. Auschwitz exhibit. And I am sickened and I'm terrified about what's going on in our country. I don't have any answers, but it's very uh, terrifying to see the rise of anti-Semitism. Uh, our temple, temple um, Israel, has is dealing with a lot of anti-Semitism, and I see this going hand in hand with what's going on with the rise of Christian nationalism. Yes, this was a very disturbing film, and what I'd like to do is take the question that we started with, what would Jesus do, and turn it around a little bit and ask you, what should we do? And I think your answer is going to be vote, which is fine. And I hope everybody here is going to vote and vote the right way. <laughs> but how do you get a message through to people who are part of this Christian national movement who don't want to hear the message? How do you convince them that what they're doing is so damaging to this country and to the democracy, uh, they just don't seem to want to hear it? What should we do? Uh, 
So, so uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so I, I'll just tell you a story from Dr. Barber. Uh, Dr. Barber often tells the story of one day going out to the Midwest to have a conversation with a group of conservative Christians. And he walked out on stage and he realized that everything he talked about, the group that he was talking to opposed. So what he started to do, he was getting ready to get into a sermon, but then he said, well, why don't we do this? He began to read the scriptures that were underlying his sermon. And the more he spent time reading the scripture, the more people started to say, amen. Amen. Yeah, I like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. People started getting on board. What he'd done is he found a common ground between he and those people that were on the other side. And then he utilized that to back into the conversation he was going to have with them. And by the end of the time, he had people amening, uh, talking about uh, making sure that people had access to food and water and health care and uh, all these things that they often opposed. Because it became not Barber speaking, not any of us speaking, it was what Jesus said. And he was building on that with them. It was a common ground that we have. We need to find more common ground. And we need to spend the time working on developing relationships. People will only listen to you when they have a relationship with you, when they have the ability to connect with you on some deeply human level. We need to spend more time developing that. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Uh, I'm from Italy, and uh, I wonder. Uh, Speak in the microphone. Oh, I can uh, talk louder. Um, anyway, um, I'm Italian, and I wonder if other countries besides the United States have uh, this problem. Yes. 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 They do? Yes. Where? <laughs> what about Italy? Yes. It, Mussolini. Yeah, but they, Mussolini is dead. Yes. So I'm talking about yeah. right now. Yeah. Right now there is a, a movement um, across many countries uh, that is moving towards the right and moving um, in this kind of same general direction. And uh, our the Prime Minister of Italy, Meloni, you know, yes. uh, what was elected as a right, <coughs> but is really behaving more like in the, in the center. So it's not about probably Hungary and other Polonia and, and so on. And I have another question. What about which, which denomination here in the United States are, have more of this type of people? Uh -oh. <laughs> You're asking about the white evangelical denominations? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, no, I mean, Southern Baptist would be many. Um, some of the Church of God. Uh, Pentecostal. Pe Pe Pentecostal as well, yeah. The one thing I will say, though, we have to realize that this sentiment, even though it is centered in evangelical congregations, even though it's centered in a Pentecostal and uh, more conservative congregations, has influenced a number of other traditions. The Catholic tradition has been brought into it around the issue of being pro-life uh, and has been animated by it. The thing about Christian nationalism, it doesn't manifest the same in every way, and it doesn't draw people because of the same reasons. People get involved, as, as uh, some of the people that were in the, the conversation said, for very good reasons. Uh, and they get animated, they get caught in it, and then they're part of a much larger movement that they don't realize they're part of. Uh, so dare I say, you can find the sentiment among Southern Baptists, but also among PCUSA Presbyterians, mm -hmm. and also among United Methodists, mm -hmm. the good ones. Uh, and, uh, among uh, all of our traditions, you can find some of this sentiment. So it's something that we need to guard ourselves against as well. 
how do we uh, see this mobilization that utilizes Christianity as a way of uh, pushing people to vote for particular agendas? How do we begin to see where that is? And then try to work to present a good version, a true version, authentic version of the Jesus movement. Thank Why don't you. you ask your question, and then I'm going to ask one to give you guys well, just a, a, a quick comment on you know about other countries. What is unique about this is, is, is in America there's this entangled kind of myth that we are a Christian nation, and and so the movie walked through how the Puritans and the Pilgrims came and all that got bound up and and it's become a narrative that's not necessarily grounded in fact and made that maybe that differentiates America, but you no, know, you've got fascism growing in Italy and in Germany and in France and in lots of other places. Unfortunately, where the church has shrunk almost nothing relative to its former size. And I would just add one more thing that makes America unique in this, and that is our entanglement with race. Yes. And yes. the fact that, that um, it's a, this movement um, buries that. Nobody's going to you know, lift that out as this is what we're proclaiming. So, uh, and that's what you've got to also address around the edges and then get to the center of it. Amen. So this is, my name is Wes Sturgis. Um, an observation from this, this has been going on, the momentum exists from a 30 year movement. Um, these guys are not looking for peace of Jesus Christ. They're, they're looking for a fight. Uh, all the leaders, if you look at them, how they're seething with, with anger and they're taking things out of context and they're preying upon the ignorant yep. yes. through the virtues of fear. So all that said is what I hope we as people who do this person from Nazareth who uh, sowed seeds of love and connection and broke down walls. What I would hope to see is we build skills within our own faith, within our own community, of how to de-escalate that fire so that they can't bring any more heat to it. And then we can engage in an authentic dialogue, one-on-one -on -one or in small communities. And to, to hit on what you said, what Jesus did, maybe we should start in rural areas and wander in that way. I'm just throwing that out there, but I'd like your comment. Thank you. So we have time for one more audience question, and then we'll bring it back here. Uh, can, can I actually one thing? Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, uh, one thing that, uh, and I just want to amen what you just said there about the, uh, the power of, uh, that Val said about the power of race as that which animates this larger movement. If we miss that point, we've missed the grunlade, we've missed the foundation upon which everything else is built. It's, they try to hide it, but we need to begin to identify that if we're gonna have some success and move it forward. So uh, how do we wrestle with that issue? Uh, again, shameless plug for the Reimagining America Project. <laughs> well, that little snippet of the movie pointed to 2044 when America is supposed to be a majority minority nation. Charlotte's a majority minority city now. So we don't have to wait. Uh, we can and must practice what this looks like now. And and unfortunately, I've, you know, it's things not necessarily Charlotte, but I think things nationally may get worse before they get better. But this is not going to go away. And so we have to stay at it. We have to stay with love. I'm sorry, there's one other question. Um, the thing I think we want to remember too that this is a political movement that started is not just the church and what it's from is a bunch of people who are disenfranchised in our society who are being indoctrinated into action to support these people who are purely about power and I think we need to find ways to um, bring the disengaged and disenfranchised together and support them and um, help eliminate the, the problem in the first place. Amen. Amen. So I, I kind of want to end it on a newsy note here. Just yesterday, 
only up to the minute news here at the Independent Picture House. Um, the Pew Research Center put out its latest uh, poll results on what people think of Donald Trump, favorable or unfavorable, based on their religious background or their religious uh, affiliation. Um, only one group really loved the guy, and that was white evangelical Christians. 67% were favorable versus unfavorable. Second uh, was 51% white Catholics. Um, and then you dip down uh, to 47% for white Protestants, not evangelical, and 48% for Hispanic Protestants. Um, interestingly, here are the groups with the highest unfavorable to Trump numbers. Atheist, 88%. <laughs> Agnostic, 82%. Black Protestant, 80%. And Jews, 79%. But what was most interesting to me was that, uh, if I can find it, um, oh, if you, among all US adults who identified as Christian, 53%, a majority, had an unfavorable opinion of Donald Trump. But, versus 46% who had a favorable view. So Christians are not a monolith, but there's definitely a battle going on here. Give you all the last word on that on those notes or anything else you want to bring up. I think getting out the vote and concentrating on where, where we're working to get that vote and also to concentrate on local elections, school board, that type of thing, you know, where education is being used as a vehicle to um, advance racism in a subtle kind of way again. Um, you know, that we need to identify the folks to come out and oppose that, basically. Um, it's, those are frightening numbers. Uh, and the fact that what we think about as the moral core values don't seem to be animating people. Uh, as much as some sort of deeper longing that's tied to this racialized vision of America does. That's quite disturbing. Uh, I just want to say that we didn't talk about this, but uh, in part this movement is part of the progression from uh, the Southern strategy that went into effect with Lee Atwater back with Nixon uh, in the early 1970s uh, that criminalized marijuana and uh, started mass incarceration. Uh, in part, it's the, the re-manifestation of the moral majority movement. In part, so this is something that continues to morph. Uh, we can't just address this uh, as a single moment in time. We have to understand the history, and then going back to this notion of the reaction against Brown versus the Board of Education, which was truly a seismic shift for the positive, <laughs> but for some, that was disturbing the very core of their being. Uh, race is such a, prob a problematic notion because it fundamentally attaches to our core identity. Mm. When we think about race and we challenge the validity, to some people it messes with the core of their identity. Uh, my identity is premised on being better than them, being superior to someone else. And if you take that away, you've undermined my ability to feel good about myself. How do we address these larger dynamics as we address this movement? I'm in. Um, in the uh, 30s, um, when the German National uh, Church, a wing of the, uh, the church started to align very, very blatantly and transparently with uh, the Nazis, another wing of the church rose up and wrote something called the Barman Declaration, and this is in the Presbyterian uh, Book of Confessions, but it, it, it lifts up a different time, but a very, very familiar scenario. And one of the statements uh, of, of the Barman Declaration uh, which stood for the rejection of aligning the church with any political movement. Uh, the language is stilted but strong. We reject the false doctrine that with human vainglory, the church could place the word, capital W, word and work of the Lord in the service of self-chosen desires, purposes, and plans. Amen. In other words, God's still in charge. And... Uh, that self-chosen part is where we err. But if we put our faith in the long term, we'll get there. Okay.
Val, last word. Last word. <laughs> um, Send us out, preacher. Yeah, I mean, and, and already said vote, go vote. Um, and in your congregations, to do the things that bear witness um, to taking care of the least and the lost. And as you do that, also engage those who are our politicians, our elected officials. Invite them in to bear witness as well. Again, it's relationships and setting up these relationships so that there is a way to communicate when you have an opinion or knowledge to share. There's some credibility there already. So we all know how to do that. It's just a matter of, of getting the will and uh, the energy and commitment to do so. Thank you all for coming. I hope I'll see you back here at the Independent Picture House. They have talkbacks all the time, so come on back and uh, thank our panelists, everybody, one more time.